I'm Glenn Scrivener and we're in Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 23. Let me ask you three thought prompter questions as we begin. When you think of God, what do you picture? When you think of Jesus, what do you picture? And when God thinks of you, what does he picture? I wonder what images spring to mind. Well, we're going to try and look at God's word and to get God's word to inform our gut feelings. That's what the Bible is for. Whatever we thought about Jesus and God and life, we then come to God's word and we see what the answers really are. So let's answer that first question from Colossians 1 verse 15. When you picture God, what do you think of? I, I wonder... I wonder what springs to mind for you. I've got a friend who imagines just a hand on her shoulder when she thinks of God, a reassuring presence like that. Many people think of a, a sort of a distant headmaster figure in the sky, high on power, low on personality, that kind of thing. I wonder what God's word says. Well, it's, it's very difficult to understand who God is because verse 15 calls him invisible. And that doesn't just mean that, that God would be a difficult uh, pictionary clue, difficult to draw. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 18 says that to see God is to know God. John 1, <clears throat> John 1 verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but God the Son, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. <clears throat> Do you see the, the, uh, the link between seeing God and knowing God? And so back here in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, the fact that God is invisible to us is a very great problem. Verse 21 tells us that we have been alienated from God, that we have been separated from God. There has been, if you like, a divorce between ourselves and God. That is why people have so many different views about who God is. If you were to ask people in your hometown, what do you picture when you think of God? You would get as many answers as there were people who you asked. Why should that be the case? Is it because God is very indistinct or is it because we are actually blind? Well, the Bible says it's the latter. We have been alienated from God and we do not know who God is. But verse 15 gives us our answer. If we want to picture God, what should we do? Verse 15 begins, he, that is Christ, the son of God, he is the image of the invisible God. And this is just such good news. It is the reverse of all our natural thinking. These days, many people think that God is obvious, but Jesus, we're not so sure about. If you ask people in your hometown, uh, do you have a view on God? Most people would say they believed in God. But if you ask them about Jesus, people wouldn't be so sure. Some would say that he's the son of God. Some would say that he's just a prophet. Some would say he's just a great teacher or a legend or whoever. We're uncertain about Jesus, but we think we're sure about God. Uh, verse 15 turns that on its head. Actually, Jesus is the image. He's the one on show. He's the one we can be certain about. God the Father is the invisible one. He's unknowable unless we come to Christ. Verse 15 actually gives us the most wonderful picture of God the world has ever seen. It says, picture Jesus. When you see Jesus come and serve and stoop and suffer and bleed and die, you are seeing God. God in all his godness. This verse says that God is entirely and utterly Jesus-shaped. It's wonderful news. Uh, Lord Byron, the poet, once said, uh, if God is not like Jesus Christ, he ought to be. I quite like that as a quote. If God is not like Jesus Christ, he ought to get his act together. Well, this verse says that God is entirely and utterly and exactly like Jesus. So what do you picture when you picture God? Colossians 1 tells us, picture Jesus. Well, all right then. What about our second question? When we picture Jesus, what do we think of? Well, hold on to your hats because in verse 16, we're going to get the most cosmic view of Christ imaginable. When you picture Jesus, what do you think of? Here's what the Apostle Paul thinks of. Verse 16, for by him, by Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. This is colossal. The Bible says that Jesus is not just the inventor of a religion. He's the inventor of the universe. 
the inventor of the universe. By him, all things have been created. Perhaps think of a, a, a bubble ring. Picture, picture a child blowing a bubble through the bubble ring, and, and the bubble ring shapes and defines the bubble. And Jesus Christ shapes and defines our world, as though the Father breathes his spirit through Jesus and out comes a world. Children love playing that game, the why game. You know, why? Why is the sky blue? Why are flowers, you know, smell nice? Why are hugs nice? They ask these questions. Why, 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 why? And of course, at the end of the day, the, the only answer is go to bed. Okay, that's the only answer that will ever uh, stop those questions. But verse 16 tells us the ultimate answer to all the why questions. Why is reality the way that it is? Because of Jesus. By him, all things were created. And for him, all things were created. Verse 16. Which gives us a question, doesn't it? If all things are for Jesus, are we for Jesus? That's a question we need, to, we need to answer for ourselves. And then verse 17, Jesus is before all things and in him all things hold together. I wonder what you think all things hold together in. Perhaps uh, if you're scientifically minded, you think of gravity or the strong and weak nuclear forces or, or things like this. No, well, according to verse 17, there's something deeper. All things hold together in Jesus. How's our picture of Jesus going? I think you'll agree, this is an immense picture of Jesus. And then I love verse 18. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. I, I love that word and, it's sort of almost this sort of pinnacle. Uh, Jesus is, is sort of mildly proud of the, the Horsehead Nebula and the Grand Canyon and the Swiss Alps, but he's really excited about the church. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's also the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. That's astonishing, isn't it? We've seen the truth that God is entirely and utterly Jesus shaped. Now we learn the truth from verse 19, that Jesus is entirely and utterly God sized. God is Jesus shaped. Jesus is God sized. Is this your view of Christ? Or do we just have the, the domesticated view of Jesus, meek and mild, there in his mother's arms, or perhaps just the preacher on the mount? Here is a cosmic Christ with whom we have to do. But look at where this paragraph is heading. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. But verse 20, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is where it is all heading. This cosmic portrait of Christ, it's heading to the cross. There are lots of passages in the Bible that will tell you what happened at the cross. And, and this verse will tell you some of that as well. As Jesus dies, he's making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is telling you what happened on the cross. But these verses also tell us who is hanging there. Who is it who's hanging between heaven and earth? He is the firstborn from among the dead. He, he is the, the image of the invisible God. He is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the source of all things and the goal of all things. And there he hangs on that cross between heaven and earth and the blood that he sheds reconciles the two, the two together. What do you picture when you picture Jesus? Do you picture this one who loves you more than his own life? This one who would rather go to hell for you than live without you. Is that what you picture when you picture this Jesus? Well, we must move on. We've asked two questions. What do you picture when you picture God? What do you picture when you picture Jesus? And then finally, the personal one. What does God picture when he pictures you? This is the one where people usually gulp a little bit. What does God think of when he thinks of me? Well, in verses 21 and 22, we see the answer is one of two things, either verse 21 or verse 22. Let's see what it is. Verse 21 says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That's one thing. That's one way that God could see you. 
And do you see those, those three uh, designations on your life, those three descriptions? Alienated, enemy, evil. God could look at you and think that if you are apart from Jesus. And you say, is that, could that really be true? Well, think about it. If everything in heaven and on earth is for Jesus and you are not for Jesus, what are you doing? You're going against the grain of the universe and you're going to get splinters. If you're not connected to Jesus, then you are out of connection with this world, out of connection with God himself. So that's one position. You could be in verse 21, alienated from God, an enemy in your mind and evil in his sight. Disconnected from God, it is a perilous state to be in. But then verse 22 gives you the good news. You want to hear the good news? I'm sure you want to hear the good news now. Here's the good news. Here's where you can be. Verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. What a turnaround. Disconnected from God, disconnected from Jesus, you are as far from God as it is possible to be. Connected to Jesus. And now there are three different verdicts on your life. Here are the three verdicts. Let these words land with you. Drink in these words. In Jesus, you are holy in God's sight. You are without blemish. And you are free from accusation. You know, so often we play the he loves me, he loves me not game with God, don't we? We think that on one day, maybe God doesn't love me because you know, I, I failed to read my Bible today. I failed to pray. I, I haven't been a very nice person today. God loves me not. But perhaps the, the next day we, we go to a prayer meeting. We meet up with other brothers and sisters and, and we feel good about our spiritual life and we feel, oh, today God loves me. But then the next day we, uh, we, we fall in some way. We fall into those sins that we are always doing and we feel like God loves me not. Is that how your Christian life is? Do you feel like you yo-yo in and out of God's favor? Not at all. Once you were alienated from God. In verse 20, 21, apart from Christ, we have no place in God's family. But in Christ, through simply trusting in Jesus, we are as close to God as it is possible to be. I wonder, what does God picture when he pictures you? Our answer to that question depends a lot on the kind of God we picture on the throne. Do we just think of the distant head teacher with his arms folded waiting for us to impress him? Is that how we picture God? No, no. Think of Jesus. Think of this Jesus, this cosmic Christ who went to hell and back for you. And when you know this Jesus, then you know God's verdict on your life. Holy, without blemish and free from accusation. You do not yo-yo in and out of God's presence. In Jesus, you are as close as it is possible to be.